My name is Scott Jean Bastiani. I'm one of the chefs here at Google. Thanks for coming today. In a couple of minutes, I wanted to introduce Barb Stuckey, but before that, I'd like to give a little bit of background while she's here today. <clears throat> Barb Stuckey has been a uh, food industry professional for the last 20 years. She spent her formative years in a Chinese restaurant uh, with her best friend's parents uh, outside of Baltimore. After college, Bob learned that the food service business from the vantage point of Kraft, back then General Foods, also Brinker International, the company that operates Chili's, Macaroni Grill, and Corner, uh, Corner Bakery, as well as Whole Foods. She later earned a graduate degree from Cornell University Hotel School. Barb is currently Executive Vice President for Marketing at Matson in Foster City, the country's largest independent developer of foods and beverages for the chain restaurant and retail food industries. Barb is known as a food trend, innovator, consumer, insights, and product development expert. Throughout her career, she has written articles for journals such as The Morning Cup, an industry newsletter distributed to about 6,000 plus food executives, and Culinary Currents. <clears throat> she also wrote the opinion pieces for the San Francisco Chronicle and Q&A column for Chow Magazine, now known as Chow.com. In 2008, she was awarded co-authorship of the opening chapter, The Business of New Product Development, of the first textbook to be published for the Research Chefs Association. When published in 2012, it will be called Applied Culinology. The blending of culinary arts and food science and technology and food product development. More importantly now, today, because she's here with us, Barb's daily job at Matson requires her to taste food and figure out how to make it better. After more than a decade of doing this, She's honed her tasting skills, which she's going to show you to do today, and shares this insight through the science of taste that's written to the general public. It's my pleasure to welcome, for the first time, to Google, Barb Stuckey. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for that welcome, Scott. And now I've lost my, oh, here we go. Um, and thanks to Google for having me. I, um, I'm going to get started in just a second. but. Most importantly, I need five guinea pig, I mean volunteers to experience the sensory demo with me. I got one, two, three, I need two more, four, five. Okay, if you guys would come take a seat up front. And on your way up, if you would take a tasting plate, and we're going to, everybody else in the audience is going to experience these experiments vicariously through your five colleagues. And then, yeah, you can put it on the plate. And then afterwards, if there's any of these experiments that they're going to do that you'd like to do, you can hang after it. I've got some extras. All right, so I'm going to tell you a little bit more about me, myself, and then I'm going to tell you why I wrote this book called Taste What You're Missing. And then we're going to do, uh, we're going to go into the, the content of the book, which is basically about how we taste. Going to do some experiments, and then at the end, I'll have uh, a little bit of time for questions and answers. Okay, so a little bit about me. You heard from Scott that I have pretty much spent my entire career in food, and I am now a professional food developer. You can put them on your laps and relax, and you look. <laughs> uh, I am a professional food developer. Uh, our development labs are in Foster City, about 20 miles north of here, and we work for some of the largest multinational food companies in the world, like Kraft and Kellogg's and General Mills, Starbucks, McDonald's. And then we work for small startup food businesses, entrepreneurs who want to introduce new foods, food, food businesses. So my job is to come up with these food business ideas and then to work with my colleagues who are food technologists and chefs. And in the case of about 10 of them, they are both food technologists and chefs. They have dual degrees. And my job is to take these ideas that exist in my head and to tell them how to make them come to life. And we, they do that, we do that through a, proto, a, a process we call protocepting. And in the process of protocepting, I found myself side by side with my food technologists and chef colleagues 15 years ago when I started in this business, not knowing what the hell was happening. Why would I taste something that was as simple as a tortilla chip and say, yeah, well, I like B better than A and C. And they would taste that same tortilla chip 
and they would get so much more sensory output from it. And so I set out looking for a book. I was looking for this book that would explain to me what was happening when I put food in my mouth and chew and swallow. And I looked and I looked and I looked and that book did not exist. And so I ended up having to learn through a painful process of experience what was happening as I was tasting in the lab. And about five years ago, I decided that that book that I'd wanted 15 years ago, I was gonna write it. So I set out on a, a process of doing some research into this field of sensory science. And that's the result. Uh, my book is the result of that experience. The book is called Taste What You're Missing. And it's basically about how we taste. And there are three sections to the book. The first one is about the five senses. Because we don't really think about the fact that food and eating is a multi-sensory experience. We say it's about taste. I like the taste of something. Well, actually, if you like the taste of chocolate, for example, you like the way it looks, you like the way it feels, you like the way it sounds, you like the way it smells, and you like the way it tastes. And so the second part of the book then goes into great depth about our sense of taste. And there are only five things that human beings can detect using only that one sense. Sweet, sour, bitter, salt, and umami. If it's not one of those five things, you're not using your sense of taste alone. So chocolate that I mentioned, the taste of chocolate is sweet and bitter, perhaps a little bit sour. That's it. It's the only taste you get from chocolate. Everything else that's happening that makes chocolate so wonderful, the melting quality of chocolate, which just happens to melt at human body temperature, precisely at human body temperature. That's the texture of it. The aromas of the roasty, toasty, beany notes, that's the smell of it. And of course, it makes a sound when you snap it. And visually, it, it should look beautifully dark and glossy and chocolatey. So the end of the book brings all these things together, your five senses, the five basic tastes, and then layers onto it other stuff that impacts the way you experience food. Of course, your culture, your personality, your experience, and your brain. OK, so we're going to start now and go through each one of the five senses. And I'm going to start with, I told you, there are only five things that we can taste. I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story about how I came to appreciate my sense of taste. So now you have to go back with me to Foster City in the lab a couple of years ago. We had been hired by this company to develop new appetizers for the restaurant industry. And this is my job to think up new appetizers that haven't been done. And I knew right away what I wanted to do. I grew up in Baltimore. My dad used to grow tomatoes. And I wanted to do fried green tomatoes, which he used to make every Sunday for breakfast. So I enlisted one of my chefs to start prototyping this. And it turns out, because we were going to sell these in huge quantities, frozen, that sliced green tomatoes were too flimsy and too wet, and they weren't going to work. So she said, well, what if we do fried green cherry tomatoes? All right, let's try that. And then my chef came back to me and said, you know what, we can't find the green ones. I can only get red ones to start prototyping. Is that OK? And so I said, all right fried red cherry tomatoes. Let's try it. And so we decided we would do some a cornmeal crust on it. And I get a page one day, and it says, Barb, please come to the lab. The prototype is ready for you to taste. Now, this is my favorite part of my job. This is when the idea that exists up here comes to life, and I get to taste it. So I walk into the lab, and my chef is dropping these beautiful cornmeal crusted cherry tomatoes into the fryer. And they're bubbling around in the fryer, and they're golden coated. And I know this is going to be a great idea. So just as she pulls the basket out of the fryer, shakes it, and I'm, I reach my hand into the basket to grab one of these lovely prototypes and put it in my mouth, I hear her start to scream. I go, ah! <laughs> that. 375 degree cherry tomato. I spit it out across the room, along with the roof of my mouth. And my entire tongue was traumatized. 
burned off a lot of taste buds. So I thought, there goes my tasting career, right? I'm a professional taster who can't taste. What am I gonna do? Well, lucky for me, taste is such an important sense that these taste buds that I burned off would regenerate in 10 to 14 days. In fact, they're constantly regenerating on your tongue every 10 to 14 days. Taste is a contact sense. Think about it. Food has to be in contact with your tongue for you to be able to experience it. That's different than the sense of smell or hearing or sight, which, is, which can happen from a distance. But taste has to be a contact sense. So it's important that these taste buds on your tongue work. We also found out very recently that there are taste buds in your gut. Now, not just food sensor receptors down there, but actual taste buds. And of course, this makes good intuitive sense when you think about it, because your stomach kind of needs to know what to do with the food you've just eaten. It needs to tell your body how to start digesting it, so it would make sense that it says, oh, there's some sweetness here, or there's some protein here. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about this very important sense. And there are three things that determine your taster type. And your taster type is how you experience the taste world. And each one of us experiences the taste world very, very, very differently. But remember, I'm only talking about this one sense. We'll get to the other senses later. So the three things that impact your taster type are your anatomy, your genetics, and your personal history. So let's start with anatomy. When I'm talking about anatomy, I'm talking about the anatomy of your tongue. So this is my fiance's tongue. And he has dyed it blue with blue food coloring, which you can do at home with your friends or your kids. Just take a little McCormick blue food coloring and paint your tongue with it. OK, so your, your tongue is painted blue. And you've got these little taste buds that are going to pop up. And you want to take a reinforcement and put it on your tongue and count the taste buds in that little circle. Now, what you're looking for is the density of taste buds on your tongue. Because the density of taste buds indicates whether or not you are a hyper taster, or what some people call a super taster. So some people have this incredible density of taste buds. Their entire tongue is densely packed with these taste buds. And then some people at the other end of the spectrum have just a few dotted around. Now, this person whose, taste bud, whose tongue is covered with taste buds will experience the tastes as three times as intense as the person who has less taste buds. So imagine that you've got all these taste buds. Something that's bitter to you is going to be much more bitter than it is to someone. Salty is saltier. Sweet is sweeter. Spicy is spicier. And we know this by counting the taste buds on your tongue. I've, offered, I've asked these volunteers to come up, and we're going to paint their tongues. No, I'm kidding. We're not. <laughs> we're not going to paint their tongues. But we're going to talk about the next thing, which is correlates with the anatomy of your tongue. And that is a genetic marker for super taster or hyper taster. So in one of your, your cups, you should have a little white strip. Now, this is a strip that is, do you have one? Yes. OK. So this is a strip that is impregnated with a specific compound that will tell you whether or not you fall into this hyper taster category with lots of taste buds on your tongue and, and the genetic disposition to be able to taste bitter things, or in the middle, where most people exist, or on the end, which I call tolerant tasters. It means that you don't have a lot of taste buds, and you're very tolerant of bitter taste. Go ahead and take that piece of paper, stick it in your mouth, and just put it in your mouth, close your mouth, and kind of suck on it for a couple seconds. Now, I'd like you to tell me, put it in your mouth for. Just don't swallow it. Just put it on your tongue. <laughs> on a scale of 0 to 10, 0 being tastes like paper, 10 being it's the most intense thing I've ever experienced. Give me a number between 0, paper, 10, most intense thing I've ever experienced. OK, take it out now. Some of you probably hate me. And there's a cracker there you can you can cleanse your palate with. Anyone have a really, really intense experience there? Yes. Moderate? Yeah, a little bit above moderate. And what did you taste? Bitter. Bitter? Anyone else taste bitter? Yes? A little bitter? 
Okay, so I think everybody on our panel is a taster, which means that they, like the majority of the population, fall in this middle group of people that have a good number of taste buds on their tongue. So the last thing that indicates your taster type is your personal history. And now that I've told you about my trauma with the tomato, there are other things you can do that traumatize your mouth or there are surgeries or viruses that you might have had that can damage your taste nerves. So if you've had your wisdom teeth pulled, for example, when you have your wisdom teeth pulled, it happens very close to one of the taste nerves, the corda tympani nerve, and that, if you snip it, can take out taste in the front part of your mouth. If you've had ear infections as a kid, if you had those recurrent ear infections, that may have damaged your taste nerve. And so there's a lot of things that can go into your personal experience that are gonna layer on top of your genetics and your anatomy. Okay, so now we're gonna move on to the more pleasant tastes. We're gonna start with sweet. So taste, let me, let me just say for a minute, this sense of taste is so important that we wire it so that it's constantly regenerating. So we call taste the deciding sense. You put a food in your mouth, you have to make a decision whether or not you're gonna swallow it. You swallow it, you get nourished, you spit it out, you don't. You swallow something that's poisonous, you can kill yourself. You spit it out, you don't. Taste is about making decisions. Smell, on the other hand, is about enjoyment. And we're gonna talk about smell in a minute. But back to taste, sweet. So we know that babies are born loving sweet. They come out of the womb, you can put a little sugar in their mouth and they will light up, love sugar. So why are we wired this way? Why do we love sugar? Why do we love the taste sweet? Energy? Absolutely, it's a flashing neon sign for calories, sweet equals calories. So if, God forbid, there was a little baby crawling around back when we were cavemen looking for food in any way, shape, or form we could get it, you find something sweet, a little baby finds something sweet, they can nourish themselves. So we're wired from the get-go to like sweet. Sour. This one's a little bit more complicated. Why do you think we can detect sour? What is it that sour communicates to us? Vitamin C. Vitamin C? <laughs> Not ripe. Not ripe. Yes, exactly. You're the first person I've ever gotten that from. And I've given this to hundreds and hundreds of people. That's exactly right. So if you take an apple off a tree, you take a bite of it and it's too sour, it might give you a stomach ache. Well, not only that, but at the point where that sweetness and the sourness in the apple are at that perfect balance where you take the bite and you go, that's a good apple. That is when the apple is at its nutritional peak. It has the highest level of micronutrients in it. After that point, it starts to decline. So it's an indicator of ripeness, exactly right. What else does sour do? What does it tell us? When the milk goes bad, it goes what? Sour, right. So it's, it's a spoilage mechanism. It's a spoilage indicator. You taste something that's not supposed to be sour and it's sour, you don't eat it. Protective. Bitter. Now let's talk about bitter. My people that are sitting up here just experience bitter. What is it about bitter that we need to know? And that why do we innately reject bitter? Poisonous. Poisonous, exactly. Most poisons taste bitter. What's even more interesting though is most bitter things are poisonous in the right quantity. So you say, well wait a second, I drink coffee, that's bitter. I drink red wine, that's bitter. They're not poisonous. They're not, but the compounds in those foods that make them bitter, if you ate enough of those compounds, you could die. Of course, you'd have to eat a lot of coffee. You have to drink a lot of red wine. And so it's generally, we generally don't ingest enough. But what bitter indicates is that there's something happening pharmaceutically or something, there's some medicinal thing going on. There are bioactives that are good for us in certain doses, maybe not so good for us in mega doses. So most medicines, what tastes bitter? 
bitter medicine. And so that's because the compounds in there that are bioactive are uh, tasting bitter. What about Brussels sprouts? What about Brussels sprouts? <laughs> Pardon? <laughs> You'd have to eat a lot of Brussels sprouts in order to overdose on Brussels sprouts. In fact, so much so that I don't think you could physically get there. It would be so uncomfortable for you and everyone around you. So you just don't want to go there. The compound in it, though, if you extracted that, that's what I'm talking about. Yes? Is it the same for spinach or green, you know, green leafy vegetables? Yes, most green leafy be vegetables, yeah. All the things in food that make them healthy and good for you are bitter. And I know this because we do a lot of work at Matson in fortifying foods with things like antioxidants and polyphenols and flavanols and all of those things taste extremely bitter. Salt. So we, when we're born, we can't taste salt. Come out of the womb and we do not have a mature salt receptor. Now this terrible story about how we found out that this is the case is that in Australia, they, they used to mix baby formula. And so they'd mix the sugar with the baby formula and feed it to the kids. Well, at this hospital, someone mistakenly mixed sugar with the formula and fed it to the babies. And they drank it like they just drank their normal formula. Didn't reject it. You know when babies don't want something. They'll let you know that they don't want it. No response whatsoever from the babies. So the babies drank this incredibly salty formula. And some of them died from salt poisoning. It's a horrible, horrible story. But we learned that we don't have mature salt receptors. But then, at a certain age, they kick in. And boy, do they kick in, right? We love our salt. So salt obviously provides sodium. We need sodium for our cell function. So we also need things like calcium, which we don't really crave in the same way. We need a lot of other micronutrients that we don't crave in the same way. Why do we crave salt this way, the way that we do? The reason is that we don't have a way to store sodium in our bodies. Right? So you, you can take in calcium in your diet. You can store it in your bones. You can store it in your teeth. You take in sodium, and you can, you can store it through water retention. But eventually, you'll lose it. You'll lose it through crying and sweating and other excretion from your body. And so you constantly need to replenish your body with sodium. Of course, that was a hangover from old times when we used to have to really, really seek out sodium. Today, we have easy access to sodium, and we don't sweat as much. I guess we don't cry as much. So we don't lose as much. So now we're taking in more sodium than we need. So you have a, a, one of your clear cups is labeled S, and this is salt. And I want you to just take a sip of the salt water and remind yourselves what salt water tastes like. This is going to be important in a minute. I find that most people kind of understand four of the five basic tastes, the sweet, the salt, the bitter, the sour. But we're going to get to the last one, umami, in a minute, which people are a little confused about. OK, so salt water, what does it taste like? Go ahead, take a sip. No, 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 you don't have to drink. <laughs> take, just take enough that you can taste the salt in it. Can you taste it? Yeah. Yes, OK. That's calibrating your palate now. You're calibrating your palate at a certain sodium level. Now we're going to move on. Oh, no, we're not. I wanted to tell you one more thing about salt, which is, and I write about this in the book. I have a chapter on each of the basic tastes. And I call salt the superhero of taste. And it is amazing what salt can do. I mean, I don't really need to tell people salt's amazing. We know it's really good. But the way it works is so cool. The first thing that salt does is that when you salt a food, take a tomato, for example, you upset the cellular balance of that tomato. And what happens is it forces these aroma compounds out of the cells into the air. So by salting food, you are giving it more aroma, which gives it more flavor. So salt not just adds saltiness, it really does give food more flavor. The other thing that salt does is I call it the superhero because it suppresses the bad guys and it lets the good guys run free. So the bad guys of taste being bitter, of course. So a little bit of salt suppresses the bitterness of something and allows the sweetness, the good taste, to come forward. 
So I've got a little wedge of grapefruit there. I, I, I recommend you go home and take a grapefruit, cut it into wedges, put some salt in a bowl and sprinkle salt on half of the wedges, and take the other half of the wedges, take that same bowl of salt, add a little touch, or same bowl of sugar, add a little touch of salt, and then sprinkle that. Taste the one with the sugar on it, and it will taste nice and sweet with a balance of the salt and the bitter that's naturally present in the grapefruit. Then you go to the one that has a little bit of salt added to the sugar. It will taste sweeter because the salt is suppressing the bitterness and letting the sweetness come forward. So salt is really the superhero of taste. Sir, quick question. So when it comes to cooking them, does that mean you should only salt at the very end? This is, that's a good question. She, the question was, should you salt food only at the end? Salt, salting the food in the middle of the cooking process will help marry the flavors. So yes, I would suggest salting during the cooking process, but saving some of the salt so that you do have the ability to do it at the table. So I would never add all the salt that you want in the recipe. You wanna leave a little bit of it out so you can add it at the very last minute and any of those volatile aroma compounds that are left will be forced out and into the air. That'll give you more aroma, the food more aroma. Okay, now the fifth basic taste, which is umami. And umami, of course, is a Japanese word for which we don't have a really good translation. We call it brothy or meaty or savory. We don't have a really good way of describing this taste, so we borrow the Japanese word. And I'm going to ask that our panelists here take the cup with the U on it. That is our umami water. So I've matched the sodium level in the umami water. So I'm going to ask you guys to describe it. What does it taste like? Seaweed or something? Seaweed? Tasty. Yep. Tasty. Tasty? What is it? Kombu. Kombu? Was it? Savory. Savory? I'm disgusting. Disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's really odd, isn't it? It's, it's very odd. So what the... The reason I do this exercise is that most of the time when we taste umami, it's in the presence of a whole lot of other things. There's aroma that goes along with it. There's color, there's texture. What this exercise does is really let you separate salt from umami, which people get confused about. And a lot of people will say it tastes like broth, like it might taste like dashi or it might taste like chicken broth. And the, what is giving the umami its umaminess is free glutamates. So these are the three forms of glutamates that we taste. Monosodium glutamate, disodium inosinate, and disodium guanylate. I'm sure that's clear as mud, right? Okay, so let me explain how umami works. So these are big protein molecules, and I use this analogy of someone putting a huge gumball or a huge cherry tomato in your mouth. When it's in that big form, you don't really get a lot of the flavor from it. You have to chew it down to release the flavor from it. And that's kind of what happens with umami. Through a number of processes, these big protein molecules are broken down into smaller free glutamates. And these free glutamates are what taste so yummy. They are savory and they're what makes food taste so good. So you take cheese. Let's start with like a fresh mozzarella. Delicious. It's got a nice fatty mouthfeel, it melts, it's got some dairy notes, perhaps a little buttery, but it doesn't have a lot else going on. You take a cheese, then you age it. And over the course of aging, those protein molecules are broken down into these free glutamates. So now think about a Parmesan cheese, where you get the big block of Parmesan, it's crumbly. That cheese is loaded with free glutamates. That's why it tastes so meaty. Sometimes you'll get a good Parmesan or an aged cheese that has that meaty character to it. That's umami. Take a tomato, a green tomato. Almost no umami. Through the ripening process, it will develop seven to eight times as much umami. So these are the things that help develop that umami. Ripening like the tomato, aging like the cheese, curing all those cured meats you take the big protein molecules and through the cure, the curing process, you develop the glutamates. Drying, fermenting. One of the reasons we love fermented foods so much is the development of these glut glutamates. Okay, so yes? So evolutionarily, what's the point of this? Because presumably our ancestors didn't have much chance to eat those kinds of foods. 
Uh, yes, that's a good point. Um, and there's some debate about whether or not this should, umami should be considered a basic taste for that very reason and the very reason that, what's your name? Neha said that, that it was disgusting because we, we generally, um, some of us like it, some of us don't like it. We don't really have a, a definitive affective response to it. And there, the protein doesn't necessarily taste like umami, but the, the amino acids do. So arguably it was because we need the amino acids for survival. Okay, so, so now we're gonna move on to the next sense, which is smell. Okay, so everybody take that jelly bean out of your pocket or your, you know, take it. Okay, so now what I'm going to ask you to do is to first of all hold up your right hand and say, I promise not to cheat. Okay, all right, so we got that on camera. So grab your nose and just plug it. Oh, this is gonna be difficult right here. Here, let me, yeah, put it on your lap, okay. Got to plug your nose. Now the point of this is to disable your sense of smell. So go ahead and put the jelly bean in your mouth and I don't want you to release your nose until I tell you to. So if, you, if you're doing this properly, you should not smell anything, okay? So start chewing, keep chewing, keep chewing, keep chewing. Tell me what you're experiencing. Kind of sweet. Kind of sweet? Yeah. Sweet, yeah. Kind of sweet, that's kind of, there's not a lot of basic taste in a jelly bean. Release your nose now. Yeah, okay, what flavor is it? Melon? Cantaloupe, cantaloupe. Yeah, so what you were getting on your tongue using just your sense of taste was sweet because that's the only basic taste that's in jelly beans. Everything else that you smell there, that whole gestalt of melon came through your nose. That's the aroma. And it's really important to understand where the sensory input is coming from. And that's now hopefully you've got a good appreciation for how much of the flavor of food comes from our sense of smell. I want to tell you a little bit about a fragrant flashback, which is my term for how powerful, one of the examples of how powerful smell is. So this goes back again to the lab at Matson, where I was walking from my office to taste some prototypes. And we, um, I have to step back and, and go back to something Scott said, which is that I'm from Baltimore. And what you should know about Baltimore is that when I was growing up in downtown Baltimore, the McCormick Spice Factory was making spices downtown. And so one day there would be cinnamon in the air at Baltimore. And then they'd switch over the lines and then they'd have basil. And then later in the day it would be cumin. And then later in the day it would be coriander. And so all of these crazy spices were hanging in the air in downtown Baltimore. Kind of a random mixture. So we have this spice library at Matson with every spice known to man. And one of our interns was in there taking the old spices and dumping them and refilling them with fresh spices because you want to keep your spices very fresh for the most aroma impact. She takes down the cinnamon, dumps it in the trash. Basil dumps it. Coriander dumps it. And I'm walking by this trash can and I, and I go over the trash can and I stick my head in it. Home. And she looks at me like, what? So that is a fragrant flashback. When you smell something and it transports you to another time. And I know you've all had experiences like that where you just smell something and you just remember something, good or bad. And that is, there's an anatomical reason for this. So when any of our senses are detected through our neurons, through our, our receptors, the information goes on its way up to our brain, it goes through something called the thalamus, and then it goes on to the brain, and we say smell or sight or whatever. I'm sorry, taste or sight. Smell does not go through the thalamus. So when you smell something, it goes right to your brain without making this kind of uh, short, without making a stop in the thalamus. So it's a more direct route from sensory experience to your brain. 
And we think that is because sense was, is our most primitive, our smell is our most primitive sense. But that's also why we have such a direct connection to emotion when we smell things. So there's two different ways that we smell. And the first way is when we just take something and we sniff it. You stick your nose in something, you smell it. That's called orthonasal olfaction. That's when the smell molecules are going like this. The other way we smell something is called retronasal olfaction. And that's when the smell comes from your mouth. So you've put a food in your mouth, you've chewed the food, and the volatile aromas that are released from it are sucked up and through the back of your nasal passages and they come back past your olfactory receptors this way. And the quality of those smells this way and choo-choo that way is a little bit different. Okay, so we're gonna do an exercise now where everybody take your straw and bend it like this. Take the long end and put it in your mouth. See how well they follow directions. <laughs> okay, so don't do this yet, but let me show you what you're gonna do. So what I've got, I've got something in this cup that is very aromatic and the volatile aromas have been building up in the headspace. And so there's a little hole here and without looking at it, just take that button, push it to the side and stick your, the short end of your straw in the hole. So you're going like this and start breathing in and out. Just breathe normally. You smell it? Don't tell me yet. You smell it? You all smell it? What is it? Blue cheese. Blue cheese. You got it. Okay. So they did not smell it before it got into their mouth and went up that way. So that was all retro nasal olfaction. Go ahead and take the lid off and stick your nose in. It's a little different, huh? Different. It's more strong. It's more strong for sure, yeah, because you're sticking your nose in there. Yeah. So the way that we experience these volatile aromas is slightly different given how they go in, whether we detect them this way or that way. And we don't really know why that is, but we know it happens. So this could also explain why something like a stinky cheese, a really stinky cheese, may just smell wrong. It just smells gross. And then you put it in your mouth and you chew it, and it's really pleasant because there's something different happening. Now, of course, when you put something in your mouth and you chew it, you're also using your sense of taste and you're probably getting some saltiness and some sour and maybe a little bitter, but you're also getting the mouthfeel of the cheese. It just coats your tongue. It's got a nice fatty mouthfeel. Okay, so that's smell. So the way that I describe it in the book is the difference between taste and smell. It's like a piece of art, because food is art, right? If it's really well made, you have a beautiful piece of art in front of you three times a day. Taste, those five basic tastes, are like the outlines of a drawing. They set up the structure of the food. But if all you had was the basic tastes, like that jelly bean exercise, all you'd have is sweet a lot of the time. All you'd have is sour some of the time. It's not really that interesting. But when you add smell, the smell comes and fills in the details. And so this art, this beautiful work of art becomes what you know it to be, the signature work of art. It's usually blocking both ways, yeah. So it's because the, the mucus in your nose is, it's in your nasal passage. It doesn't matter which way it's going by. There's too much mucus for, for you to be able to smell. It's, it's in the way of the olfactory receptors, but that's a good question. So with smell, so we, 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 it fills in the details for us and it gives us the pleasure from food. Remember, taste is the deciding sense, smell is the pleasure that we get from food. Okay, now I'm gonna talk about touch, and texture. And I'm gonna talk about texture in combination with what you just learned about smell. And you guys have a, hopefully you have a spoon, do you have a spoon on your plate? No. 
Now why don't you take the straw and just dip it in the butter. So what the, oh, there you go. What everybody has here is just dip the spoon in and don't eat it yet. What they've got is unsalted butter. And when we're cooking, when we're developing foods at Matson, we always use unsalted butter. If you use salted butter, when you take the amount of butter up in your recipe, you also take the amount of salt up. So you want to separate those variables so you can change the variables separately. This is unsalted butter. OK, now take this spoon in one hand and close your nose with your other hand. Now what I'm going to prove to them is butter has no flavor. I'm sorry, butter has no taste. Plug your nose, put the butter in your mouth, and just swish it around. What are you tasting? Oil. Oil. Nothing. Nothing. OK, let your nose go. Okay. Butter, unsalted butter, has zero taste. There's no sweet, no sour, no bitter, no salt, no umami. So I always thought of butter as being creamy and sweet. And yeah, it's creamy, but it's not sweet. It doesn't have any sweetness in it. And so what we love about butter is not the taste of butter. You don't like the taste of butter because it has no taste. What you like about butter is that oily mouthfeel in combination with those lovely buttery floral green aromas that you get. Go home and do that tonight with unsalted butter. This was such an aha for me. Butter has no taste. It's crazy. But we do love the flavor of butter. Um, when you brown butter, are you developing the aromatics or the um Yes, but that butter also, if you're using unsalted, will not have any taste either. No, you are developing the aroma compounds through the browning process. But if you hold your nose, same thing. You're going to get no taste, no taste, no taste, fatty mouthfeel, butter. All right. So now we're going to talk about kinesthesia, which is the awareness of the position and movement of the parts of the body by means of sensory organs in the muscles and joints. And this is where texture and touch gets really interesting, because we put food in our mouth all the time, and we talk while we're chewing and swallowing without even thinking about it. It's a pretty amazing thing that we do, <laughs> if you think about it. We, don't, we, we can manage the, the swallowing, the chewing, and the breathing at the same time. How do we know when it's time to swallow? We just know. We're aware of the food in our mouth at all times, but we're not paying attention to it. But we're aware of it. That's why we don't choke ourselves to death when we eat. We know when it's time to swallow. And if you think about it, next time you chew, think about what side you're chewing on. Everybody always has a dominant side. But you only chew on one side at a time. You never chew on both sides at the same time. It doesn't happen. You chew over here. Then you push it over there, then you chew over there, then you push it over there, then you chew, then you push it over. You can't chew on both sides. It's the only joint in the human body that you can't operate separately. You can't do it. Another experiment for you to do. There is a cup, there are a couple of foods that I call irritastes because we commonly think of them as tastes, but they're not tastes at all. They are actually tactile experiences. And they are irritants. So the first one is tannin. If you think of the tannin that you get when you drink tea that's not sweetened. Or red wine, a really big California Cabernet has tons of tannin. That tannin will feel astringent on your tongue. It will dry your tongue out. It will suck all the moisture out of your tongue. That is a textural experience. That's a tactile experience, not a taste. It's not bitter. Now, if it's Grapes, there might be some bitterness in there, but the tannic quality of grapes and tea is not a bitterness. It's a, an astringent texture. Jalapenos. We love the taste of jalapenos. Well, actually, jalapenos don't have a lot of taste. It might be a little bit sour, but not much. But what you're experiencing, the burn of jalapenos, is a tactile experience. It's working on the same fibers as pain. It's like, you know, you take a fork and jab it into your tongue. That's basically, <laughs> that's basically what you're doing when you eat a chili. I mean, we are the, also, we're the only species on Earth that enjoys food that's painful. 
but we love it. It's an irritant. Coca-Cola, car carbonated soft drinks like that are irritants. They, these little bubbles irritate your tongue. Now, it's a pleasant irritation. We like it, but it's an irritation nonetheless. All right, so now I've hopefully explained to you the difference between taste and smell and texture. So flavor is the combination of all three. It's the taste, back to the chocolate example, the taste of chocolate is bitter and sweet and maybe fruity depending on the chocolate varietal or how it was prepared. The texture of chocolate is that melty, creamy, hopefully not too waxy mouthfeel. And then the aromas of chocolate are the lovely browned, roasted, toasted beanie notes that we get. You might get some floral or some fruity notes as well, depending on the varietal. That is the flavor of chocolate. So when you talk about the flavor of butter, you're talking about the combination of taste, texture, and aroma. Okay, now, we talk about sight. We're going to talk about how we use our sense of sight to experience food. And some of these things are pretty obvious. If I show you these two steaks, which one is going to be more tender? The one on the top or bottom? Top, obviously. You knew that right away. You used your eyes to see that the marbling is greater. So you're constantly making these judgments about food based on its sight. And sometimes once you see it and you make a judgment, it's really hard to change your mind when something's not quite right. Beer brewers. And they were brought into a research facility, and there were three beers. Let's just say one was Amstel, one was Budweiser, and one was Coors, A, B, and C. So they took three glasses of Amstel beer, poured them into pints, and then they added a little bit of color to number two and three, Amstel. And they did the same thing for Bud and Coors. So you got three, three glasses of Amstel in three different colors, three Bud, three Coors, three different colors. So then you have these professional beer brewers come in and taste them. In the dark, when they're sitting in a dark room and they have to rely only on their senses excluding sight, they get them right. They're beer brewers. They should know how to taste beer. Then you turn the lights on. You have them do the same exact exercise and they fail miserably. These are professional beer brewers that do this. So that, what do they do? They group them by color. And then you ask them, why did you group them this way? Oh, well, they all taste the same. These all taste the same. Well, they just did the experiment and got it right in the dark. We don't even know when our eyes have overrided what we experience. It happens all the time. And this type of research was done with gelatin. It was done with candies. It was done with fruity beverages. You can do it with wine. There's a very popular, a very famous study that was done with white wine, a little bit of red added to one of them, so it looked like red wine. Same thing, you can fool wine professionals. <coughs> so why? Why does our eyes, why, do they, why are they so influential? So there's a couple reasons. The first is that sight is fast. In terms of processing of the sensory input, sight happens 10 times faster than smell. So if we were able to control it in a perfect environment, which would be really hard to do, but if we could control when we smelled something and when we saw it, we would process the smell faster via, I'm sorry, we would process the sight faster. It's faster than the other senses. And then the other thing is that sight happens at a distance. So back there, you can probably see me, right? I hope you can't smell me. So, you have to be a lot closer to smell something. You have to be even closer still to taste it, remember? Because taste is a contact sense. It has to be in touch with your tongue. And so you have these senses that have to be a whole lot closer to you for you to start making judgments about it. So the first one that happens, the first thing you see, kind of biases or infects your ability to make a good decision. And now this last sense that we're going to talk about. I'm going to unplug this so you're without your sense of sight. And um, I'm going to ask you some questions about a couple of different audio files. Okay, 
this is a restaurant. What do you know about this restaurant? They have an open kitchen or a closed kitchen? Open kitchen. This is an open kitchen. They have carpeting. Do they use paper or plastic or real silverware? They use real glasses. They use real silverware. Is it full? Pretty full. All right. So, this is... Are we supposed to get slammed or something? Delfina Restaurant in the Mission, which is uh, a restaurant that has thought a lot about its sound. And if you talk to Craig Stoll, the chef owner there, he will point up and he'll say, now it's $10,000 worth of sound panels that I've applied to my restaurant. And he knows, he knows very well that sound can have a somewhat masking effect on flavors. So he talks about his food being authentic Italian via California, but he says it can't be as subtle as it is in Italy. So I have to turn it up, and he actually used that analogy. I have to turn the volume up a little bit to compete with the energy of my restaurant. And he's a very smart restaurateur to know this. There's some research that was recently done in the fuselage of an airplane with jet engines going. And the people in the airplane experienced food with the jet engines going, that constant thrum of those engines. They experienced the food as less salty and less sweet than they did in the absence of that noise. So we know that sound has a masking influence on tastes and flavors. We also know that it can pull you in one direction. We can actually put a bitter taste in your mouth with the right music, or I should say the wrong music. <laughs> All right, I have two more audio files. Okay, so these are files of me pouring water from a tea kettle into a cup. One of these files is hot water, and one of these files is cold water. I want you to listen and tell me which. This is file number one. This is file number two. Which one was hot? How'd you know that? Yes, everybody, hundreds of people I've done this test with, everybody gets it. How do you know the temperature of water from the sound? You just, you know this. You're so in tune with the sound of your food. Incredibly in tune to the point where you can tell the temperature of water by its sound. Yet we take this totally for granted. We don't really think about how much information we take from the food's sound. Bite into an apple, and if it crunches one way, you know it's gonna be a good apple. You bite into it and it crunches the wrong way, oh, you know it's not gonna be right. Okay, so in summary, what I have hopefully taught you today is just the basic fundamentals. I have a chapter on each one of the five basic senses all five of which we use incredibly well when we experience food. Food that tastes good, using the word improperly, looks good, sounds good, feels good, smells good, and tastes good. Then I have a chapter on each one of the five basic tastes and go into them in great detail. Sweet, sour, bitter, salt, and umami. And how understanding how they work and how they work in balance and how you can balance the taste in a food is really important because once you get the five basic tastes right in a dish, the rest is easy. It's the structure of the dish. So I say once you have this fundamental understanding of how we experience taste, just like anything that you study, the more you understand about it, the more appreciation you're gonna have for it. The more you study something, the more you understand, the more pleasure you get from it. And that is the whole point of this book, is that you start to understand what's happening via all of your senses and all of your tastes and how they're being stimulated. 
and then you can take more pleasure from it. So that is all. Thank you to my five volunteers. <laughs> I have, oh, I forgot to, yeah, I was going to make you tape your nose oh. up, but <laughs> um, I have a couple minutes, I think, for questions, maybe. Bitter is the indicator. Bitter is the one that correlates with the anatomy and the genetic ability to taste, and the other ones follow suit. So if you do not taste that paper as bitter, if you just taste it as bitter, you're not going to taste salt as intensely or sweet, and so it follows along exactly. Um, we don't use the others to, to, to test because they don't, um, the, the bitter one is, is one that we, we know the genetics to that. We don't know the <coughs> genetics for the other four basic tastes, but they're correlated. So once we get that one right, we know what the other ones are gonna pretty much be. The second part of your question, which is can we, train ourselves. Yes, and hopefully that's, there are a number of exercises in the book, kind of like these exercises, which are like for the, the one we, we did where we separate salt from umami, and being able to understand the difference between salt and umami. Once you do that exercise, then you're gonna be much more aware of the umami in your foods. So it's simple training. So it, it, one of the, the hardest things to do is to take something and just sniff it and know what it is without seeing it. That is really hard for chefs to do. It's just very, very hard. But people that do it professionally, people that are in the wine business, for example, or in the perfuming business, tend to be better at it. And so it does show that practice makes perfect. Um, for example, when I started in food development, my colleagues would talk about rancidity and what was rancid. And I just, I had no idea what rancid was. So. I begged them, please let me taste something rancid. I, I just, <laughs> next time there's something rancid, can you point it out to me? And I have a, I have a little rancid vial, if anybody wants to smell rancidity. Because I had to train myself, I had to, because I, I wasn't detecting it. I didn't know what to look for, I didn't know what to smell for. Now I know, and now olive oil, I can smell rancid olive oil a mile away. But 20 years ago, I couldn't. So it's practice makes perfect. Really, really, really does help. Practice make perfect principle hold true for foods you don't like? <laughs> yes. Like Brussels sprouts. Yes, yes, yes. So, um, so research has shown that it takes between five and eight attempts at a food before not rejecting it. So that doesn't mean you're going to become, after the fifth or the eighth taste, you're going to become the world's biggest fan of Brussels sprouts. But keep trying it. Give, it, give yourself a couple of times. And your, your taste buds and your olfactory system change dramatically as you age. So you might decide if you keep trying it, keep trying it every, every couple of months um, or every season, every Brussels sprout season, try it again. As you age and your olfactory changes, you may be able to um, experience it with less of the sulf sulfury smell or you may be able to experience it with um, less, more sour and less of the bitter. Your, your whole physiology with regard to taste changes. So I would suggest continuing to taste. So there are two pieces to it. So there's the degree which I can affect it by just consuming it more. Yes, it's called mere exposure. Just the mere exposure to something. And I'll give you an example. When I started in the Matson lab 15 plus years ago, I hated canned tuna. Just the smell of canned tuna was disgusting to me. Then I got a tuna project. And for four years, I ate tuna every day. I had to. I tasted canned tuna every day. I love tuna today. I love it. I mean, I just, I, because I can, I mean, I don't love every kind of tuna. I like good tuna. And I'm discriminating now about my canned tuna. I like the once cooked, not the twice cooked. And I like the albacore, and I don't like the light. And so mere exposure will help. Yeah. Yes, yeah, and I think the question was, have I tried stinky tofu or durian? And I think durian is, um, I think there's something similar that happens with durian that happens with a stinky cheese, which is the orthonasal smell of durian is just, if, if you haven't smelled it, it's, it's, it's kind of like rotting flesh, like garbage, sewage, it's, it's just really rank. Uh, but people love it. 
And so something different happens when you eat it. Of course, when you eat it now, you're not just getting, so what happens, I think, is when you're smelling it, all you're getting are those rank odors, and you get them one way. Then you put the fruit in your mouth. Now you've got sweet and sour basic taste, because now you can use your sense of taste. So you take that rank odor, and you combine it with the sweet and the sour that you get from taste, and now it's something different altogether. And maybe things sort of start to fall in place. So there are a lot of foods like that where we, we think that the, the smell is just so, stinky tofu comes up all the time, just unbearable. But taste it, if you put it in your mouth, if you can get it, if you can get it into your mouth, you'll have a different experience of it. Of course, a lot of this is cultural too. You know, stinky cheeses, you grow up in France and a stinky cheese shop smells really good to you. And, bitter thing ever. Kale? Kale. And my wife is convinced that it has no taste at all. You can't even tell it's there. How, how can I um, let them know that they're like both right and they both have yeah. different taste experiences? So what you've just described is what I hope people take away from this book, which is taste empathy. <laughs> we have to have taste empathy. And, and really, we don't talk about it in this country. Like, it's OK for us to say, you know, I can't see that over there because I don't really have good eyesight. But yet, we don't accept the fact that one of our other senses can vary from person to person, right? We all have different vision, different visual acuity. And so what I think happens, or is happening in your household, is your wife is a tolerant taster, meaning she has probably a very, very um, not so densely populated tongue with taste buds. Um, and she genetically is probably also unable to taste the bitterness in kale. And so she might be right. To her, in her private sensory world, kale is crunchy and fresh and vegetal and not bitter. And then in your daughter's sensory world, it might be the most bitter thing she's ever put in her mouth. And they're both right. You're exactly right. They're both right. And of course, you can never know what's another person's sensory experience. Yeah, you should do that at home. Take the blue dye and, and paint your daughter's and your wife's tongue and then have them count the taste buds inside the hole of the reinforcement and they can prove it to themselves that they have very different anatomy. And then that hopefully will give your wife some taste empathy. <laughs> Is it big enough to count? Yes. Yeah, you, 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 just, you're going to need to get really close to a mirror. But watch out, because blue dye stains carpets and towels. I've found this out the hard way. <laughs> it, Final question. Yeah, um, uh, along those lines, I was wondering if you have any explanation um, specifically for why some people claim that cilantro tastes like soap. I always get this question. Always get this question. So cilantro is a really interesting thing. In the food world, we call it polarizing. You, you just don't sit on the fence about cilantro. You either love it or you hate it. And um, so we know a lot about cilantro. We know that there is a genetic component to your liking of cilantro. And the way we know this is that we do research with twins. So there's this place in Ohio called Twinsburg. And every year they have a twin festival. And all these twins go there, and the researchers are just drooling at the mouth because they can take a set of fraternal twins and a set of identical twins and test something. And of course, you can determine by the correlation whether or not there's a genetic component to it. If the correlation is perfect for the identical twins who share 100% of their DNA, but not for the fraternal twins who don't, in fact, they're just like any other set of siblings, you know there's a genetic component to it. We know there's a genetic component to the liking of cilantro. The other thing that we know about cilantro, and there's been a lot of research on the subject. This is a, such a polarizing food. But what, it, what apparently happens is that when you, you run cilantro through the GCMC, or G, GCMS, the gas chromatograph mass spectrometer, which is what you can, you can run something through to get the volatile aroma menu out of it. And um, you kind of expose someone to the smells that occur in cilantro. There, 
is an, an aroma experience that people who love cilantro get that people who don't, don't get. And the same thing, people who hate it, just, they're, so they're smelling different, you know, when you run something through this GCM, GCMS, it gives you spikes in volatile aromas. There are certain things, certain volatiles in the cilantro that people that hate it are not experiencing. And there are certain things in there that people who love it are not experiencing. So they're getting different pictures of it, right? They're not, neither one of them is getting the same picture as the other. And so this is true of cilantro. It's probably true of a lot of foods, but there's been a lot of research done on cilantro. And so it, it, you know, that is that your personal experience of the aroma of, scent of cilantro may be very different than someone else's. The beautiful stuff that makes it beautiful to you may not occur, may not be happening in someone else's experience. Or the disgusting part that you find really offensive may not be experienced by people who ate it. So going back to your earlier comment about you know, sort of sound and, and restaurants, does that mean like if, if you're a really good chef, you should try to get a really, really quiet restaurant, and if your food's not so good, you should just <laughs> have it as loud as you want and blare loud music? And everything. Yeah, I don't think it's that literal. <laughs> And, and I hope chefs don't take it as that literal. Of course, you want some sound. You want appropriate sound in your restaurant. You want to pair the sound with the music. I mean, you want to pair the sound and the music with the food. It needs to be appropriate. And so I think what, what chefs try to do, or what restaurateurs, I don't know that it's chefs necessarily, what restaurateurs try to do is build ambiance into the restaurant. And they try to build energy into the restaurant via sound. And, that can work in some cases where the food can stand up to it and where you want that energy. There are other restaurants where the food is much more subtle and you want people to experience the subtlety of it, which probably wouldn't work. So it's, it's so different for every experience, every restaurant, every chef, every owner, and every type of food. It's just, what I'd like people to think about is just Think about it, period. Just think about the sound of food, which we just don't think about those two things together. All right, well, I think that um, wraps up our, our time for right now. We'll have some time for more questions at the book signing. But Barb, thank you very much for thank speaking you. with us today. Thank Great you job. guys for having me.